great to see a lot of friends and faces. Um, the Bio Art Lab at SVA is the first Bio Art Lab in an art school in the United States. There are other bio art laboratories like Symbiotica or Incubator, etc., but they're not in art schools. They are either in a forensics department or um, a university, etc. So when I sort of posed this idea to the president of SVA, he thought I was really crazy. He had no idea what this was. And um, many people don't have any idea what this practice is, because it's a very contested territory. I know that uh, basically the term bio art has, uh, if you look it up on Wikipedia, it's a very lame definition. I think also, uh, depending on which faction of bio artists you speak to, you will get other response. No one really knows who invented this term. Okay? It's a term that sort of came after Sci Art and Art Sci that was from the Wellcome Trust and the Kubankian Foundation. So don't listen to anyone who says they invented the term because I've asked a zillion people and no one knows. Okay, let's begin here. Um, I'm going to begin by showing you a little film clip that was in the World's Wall Street Journal. We made the front page of the Wall Street Journal about two weeks ago, which is shocking. So let's take a look at the clip. At the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan, Plant researcher Sebastian Kachopo is trying to create genetically modified plants, mostly from information he learned on the internet. One of his pursuits in the school's bio art lab? The Blue Rose, considered the holy grail of horticulture. I think the main reason why people are trying to make blue plants is because there are very few, if not any, of blue plants out there that are manipulatable or growable in a specific condition. Basically because those high saturation colors just simply do not exist in nature. GMOs, or genetically modified organisms, have drawn a considerable amount of controversy with concerns about the potential impact on health and the environment. Pachopo doesn't think such worries apply to projects like his. The main argument I would have towards anybody who contests us uh, going through this project is the fact that it will be contained in its plant, so we're not uh, working with pathogens or any other type of human or mammal tissue. Susanna Anger sees the process as more of an art project than a science experiment. Artists here use science as a tool, so they are not engaged in research in the same sense that a scientist would be. Blue is kind of an area of wonder. Children say, why is the sky blue? All the time is one of their first questions, and I think that is in part the, the background of this. But I do think that even if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter because it's art. The process is meticulous and complex. It all comes down to identifying and manipulating a specific gene that can give the plant its color. The gene in question called AD blue produces a beautiful cerulean gene in bacteria. It's never been tested in the plants as far as I know. So this will be the first time that we actually try to put it into the plant. With the project about halfway done, the trouble was still tackling problems. But he says even if it fails, the experiment will be a loss. In an ideal situation, in another three months, we'll have a review. Worst case, it might not work at all, and that's that's the risk that we're, we're willing to take, and that's the risk that we want to attempt, because even a failure might be useful in terms of understanding the process of that. So one would, would sort of ask the question, well, why are you interested in a blue flower, particularly the blue rose? And uh, my answer to that is the fact that the blue flower is been scattered in literature from Novalis to um, Philip K. Dick, to uh, the guy who did Eyes Wide Shut, um, to David Lynch, etc. So that there's a whole semiotic involved from the humanities point of view in the blue flower. When you see blue roses in the store, they're not real. Okay? They have been dipped into some pigment and the, so the vascular structure the uh, petals turn blue. So this becomes another 
kind of experiment in the difference between nature and culture, or the divine, or the um, non-divine, or the osmotic flow between the artificial and the natural, if we can even use that word natural anymore. Another part of this question is what is bio-art? And as I said, it depends who you talk to. And uh, there were a group of artists who decided that bio-art was only wet lab art. Well, if you're talking about biotechnology, technology plays a great role in this endeavor. You would not get the human genome drafted without technology. You could not do a number of processes in biology without technology. So just to say it's wetware, I think, cuts it too short, as William Myers was talking about yesterday. So I've divided it into three categories. One is wetware, where you can see this portrait of uh, Sir John Sulston, um, a scientist from London that Mark Quinn did. And this piece is now in the permanent collection of the Portrait Gallery in London. And this is sort of the residua of, of cells taken from Sir John Selston and allowed to percolate. Uh, Patricia Piccanini also is very important in this area because of the iconography of biotechnology. Um, the idea of narratives of biotechnology really spark the cultural imaginary, which is one way of communicating science, but is also an index of our hopes and fears about what these new technologies will do. Um, technology is biology. Biology is technology. And we're going to see these intersections all the time in the future. Uh, the piece on the right I have here on number 10, and this is called Remote Sensing. It's made by a machine. It's a rapid prototype sculpture who actually put all the color on it, too. You know, if you would have told me I could make sculpture without touching it 50 years ago, I would end up in the loony bin. I'm going to show you a couple of living things. Um, the astroculture piece that I started in 2009, in which I grew vegetables and exit art in a show called Corpus Extremis. And this was kind of based on what astronauts were beginning to do to grow things in outer space, hence the name astroculture. And I would go there on a regular basis and take pictures of what was happening. And what I realized was that fuchsia is really the new green, because the red and blue lights are that part of the spectrum which create photosynthesis. So in working on these pieces, I got to sort of see that I don't have to use Photoshop, because this lighting arrangement really tells everything I need to know. A more recent piece, which is up at uh, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City right now, it's a six-month-long show called The Value of Food. I have the only living work in the show, and uh, what I've done now is expand my ready-made uh, cubicles there to now become large-scale. You can kind of see the, um, the light coming through the stained glass windows. And before you even enter this little chapel, I have my own chapel up there, you see this radiance that, again, invokes a kind of spiritual domain. So the piece is now called Eternal Return as the plants continue to grow. When people come in and see this piece, they don't think it's real, like the blue rose. And here you can see that um, if you shine a light on it, you can see that it is actually green and is actually alive. Um, it got picked up by a few magazines. One was Popular Science, who wanted to know why an artist is growing spaceless. And um, the reason I was growing 
white space lettuce is because everything we know about botany is being um, essentially revolutionized. Uh, when the Japanese astronauts went up to space to grow cucumbers a while ago, what they found was whereas on Earth you get one sprout from the plant, whereas in space, under anti-gravity conditions, you get two sprouts. So eventually, we will be able to decipher um, much more about the way in which plants produce their own food. Um, here are some of the astronauts here, um, and this is, this is uh, very recent. This time, they were allowed to eat the lettuce. Uh, they were not allowed to eat the cucumbers, uh, but I see they have a very good time here. And this is, this is their system of them. Um, I'm going to show you a few more bioart projects which I think really pierce this divide I was talking about between art and science and uh, of course they're very general categories but they are being fused more, uh, more and more together. They'll never be um, perfect. They'll never actually be able to one replace the other. Different epistemologies, different lecture. Okay? Uh, but this is Jalila Asani's work, uh, Bulletproof Skin, and she worked with a group of scientists and uh, caterpillars to create this, uh, this very strong silk. Um, it almost worked, but a scientist, I don't think, would come up with this idea. Another idea by Christina Agapakis and Sisal Tolis, they wanted to know why cheese is so stinky. So they went around um, in their group and they took uh, samples from uh, bodies of their collaborators. They have a toe, they have a hand, they have an armpit, they have a nose, etc. cetera. Uh, they cultured these bacteria in cheese and then did an analysis that didn't eat it yet. Um, <laughs> But they, they sort of, through the sense of smell, they were able to extrapolate and, and sort of refer it to different cheeses that we do actually eat. Which brings us to Julius Richard Petri. Now, he, of course, is the inventor of the Petri dish, which has now become a cultural icon. It's almost the signifier bio art, and you can see that all around the room, um, as well as in other contexts. It also is a place where things grow and information emerges. Uh, before Petri's uh, invention, he was uh, working in Robert Koch's laboratory, who's the renowned uh, microbiologist, and um, they were using microbes sort of that had a bell jar on them. Well, you know, you can't put a bell jar under a microscope. So that this invention revolutionized microbiology. Now, everyone knows Louis Pasteur, and they know um, some other microbiologists, but everyone knows who Petri is. Do you know who Robert Koch is? No. So it again has entered into popular culture to the degree that even Google, and then we hold your ears and you will lower it, the music is terrible here. Even Google, for the 161st birthday of Julius Richard um, Petri, essentially did a Google. Let's go here. Maybe yes, maybe no.
Now, why would they pick Petra? You know, you would, you would assume that uh, they would pick someone else. I mean, his Petri dish, although it has been a uh, major invention in biology, the paper he wrote on it was 300 words. He was not really known uh, as a significant player in this game, even though the Google Doodle said he was. He wasn't. And, uh, and as I said, everyone knows his name. Um, another very important scientist uh, is Alexander Fleming, whom you know through his discovery of penicillin. Well, he was very well known for having an extremely dirty lab. And he had a pile of Petri dishes, left them uncovered in a sink, had the window open, left to go on vacation for a weekend, and comes back and sees this ring of fungus uh, growing in one of the Petri dishes, and all of the staff that is in the dish is dead. So the discovery of penicillin in, by accident um, was something to consider about how scientists actually, although they may follow the scientific method, at some point something else may happen that is serendipity and they're able to recognize what that is. Uh, Fleming was also an amateur artist. He hung out at the Chelsea Arts Club. A lot of his friends were artists, ironically uh, enough, um, suffering from uh, deadly venereal diseases. <laughs> but um, he decided that he was going to paint with bacteria. And these are his images. These were very difficult paintings to make because the different bacteria would bloom in a particular color, and he would have to have them all bloom at the same time in order to see the image itself. Now, we have the uh, proteins, fluorescent proteins, that we can use as painting techniques. The, there were three, three scientists who shared a Nobel Prize for the uh, GFP protein, glow in the dark, etc., And we work with this protein in our lab, and students make paintings with them. And like surrealism, since it's on agar and you can't see what you're doing, there's a certain sense of automatic writing in it. Uh, this is one of our inventions, actually. We invented black agar. Scientific literature says that it wouldn't work for uh, these kinds of plasmids. Well, it does. And not only does it work, but we made a sculpture out of it as well, where we carved into the, um, in, into the agar itself. Um, uh, Lena Espinosa did the subway map of New York City, and Yakov Abrahami. Um, did this beautiful, looks like watercolor, but it's not, it's all done with GFP. And a really interesting idea here is by Leora Euclea, who decided that there was too many, there were too many trees being cut down to make furniture. So she decided that she was going to grow a table and a chair. And uh, here she is, of course, culturing the uh, mycelium. Um, and then eventually, she actually, this is the final result. It's half Ikea and half mycelium. <laughs> Remote sensing, OK? Sometimes when there's too many wars or there are too many toxic environments, uh, satellites are used to collect data. And these kind of, this kind of data in landscapes is then converted <coughs> into zeros and ones and can form a picture. Uh, so what sort of struck me was that these little sculptures reminded me of landscapes in general, which is a genre in art historical discourse, which comes from another art <coughs> historical discourse genre, the vanitas. Um, this was part of a project that started in my lab when I was teaching students to use the microscope. And I said to myself, as I was looking 
through the microscope, that looks like a vanitas. I said, why don't you make some vanitas in Petri dishes, kind of bringing the vanitas up from the 17th, 18th century into biotechnology. And a lot of what is uh, in these dishes essentially are animal, vegetable, and mineral that sometimes refer to synthetic biology. And taking the two-dimensional images and turning them into three-dimensional images, a whole different sensibility occurs about what you're looking at. So this idea of imaging in bioart is critical to the way in which we can begin to perceive situations differently. Um, recently, I did this rainbow loom piece in Beijing, China. The first one I did here was at Art Laboratory Berlin in 2011. And what I did was I collected things from the locale. And um, I did one in Shanghai also. And what I found was that, not to my surprise, but the world is not global. That almost everything, except for very particular stuff that is culturally derived, like fungus uh, in Beijing where people eat it in soup, um, or in Berlin there were these cookies that looked like um, eggs, like sunny side up eggs, that most of the stuff is uniform. So when one begins to now divide them by color, what happens is that uh, one can sort of see what the natural world is made of from a color point of view, as well as what the synthetic world is made of. So although there are very few plants or items that are blue in nature, in synthetic materials, there's lots and lots of blue. So um, I organized uh, this table, which was interesting to me, because I never saw people spend much time at an art exhibition. We usually go in, walk around the room, and they're out of there. Okay? What happened, because of the intimacy involved in the size of these things, people would gather around the table and look very carefully. So rather than making it big, making it small is a better idea. <laughs> okay, I'm going to now... Um, uh, wait. Okay. Depth range with this auger. 
And here is an example of an urban garden in, in, in Brooklyn. Uh, we also encountered the Lamont soil testing kit, which is a kit that uses color as an indicator for, um, for different kinds of nutrients that are in the, in the soil, such as nitrates, nitrites, potassium, blah, 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 blah. And um, it struck us that the kind of colors we were getting here um, were being interpreted by the kit. And here you can see some of the, what looks like colorated paper, but the idea is to take the soil sample, put it through what looks like a uh, coffee maker so that we get a liquid um, out of the soil and then test it with one of the, um, the, the Lamont chemicals. Problem with Lamont chemicals is they're extremely toxic. And that's what farmers use. And we thought, well, maybe there's a better way to do this. Um, so we came up with a microfluid device, which we used a lot of art techniques in order to build. If you buy one of these, it's very expensive. But we made one. And this is a copper board, and it was etched so that it has these different lanes. And then we sort of cast it in an acrylic and, um, and did an oxygen plasma treatment on it. And what we came up with um, to kind of show the distribution of soil throughout the five burrows, and here you can kind of see our drawings for it, um, what we came up with is the use of an Arduino to represent each color. So um, we could tell by looking at the maquette where the soil samples were heavy in one particular nutrient or another. Uh, that was all converted to these color charts. This is not a Damien Hurst, okay? This is scientific imaging. And um, what we have here is uh, some of the array that we will show with this installation when we do it again at school. And here is our trophy. This <laughs> uh, cost a lot of money because it cost a lot of money to go to Boston and bring the students and uh, enter the competition. But we got best integrated human practices, best education and public engagement, best presentation. And I like to think of this as an art project because of its social outreach. And visual art has now developing these new categories like relational aesthetics, but also social outreach is a big one. And the stories that my students came back with when they visited people to test their soil were amazing. Um, you know, a lot of people who came from other lands who wanted to create this sense of home uh, by planting their gardens with vegetables. Um, and then finally, this is my last slide here. If you're interested in following any more of this discussion, uh, these are some of my books. Uh, the Molecular Gaze on the upper left was the first book, I think, devoted to the intersection of art and genetics. It was in 2004, and it was published by Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press, the first art book and last art book that they, they ever uh, produced. My current book is right up front. If you want to look through it, it's The Glass Veil, Seven Adventures in Wonderland, and it's about seven different groups of work I've made in the last 10 years. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. say, 
uh, a dog soccer ball with a, um, a round stick. And um, so I had sort of one from nature, one from culture, and cast all of those things in bronze. Now in the same exhibition, I had attached kaleidoscopes onto the ends of vessels that were pointing towards a bowl of 100-year-old eggs. And the bowl was copper, and the way it reflected the light, um, and because it was circular, it led me to believe that this was very cellular. So I went home, and this is 1988, I went home and looked through my daughter's old biology book, looking for an entity that was not a disease. And I came up with the chromosome, and it essentially involved me. It took me about a year to actually build them out of sculpture, because every time I looked at pictures of them, and they were at different resolutions, they looked like something else. So I decided that I would make a whole body of work around this issue, and, um, and that's how it started.